Hello, um, we're on with the next episode. Um, this is from KC, uh, questions and answers, I should say. KC says, I have a portable, a portable workbench and I was hoping to bring it to my downtown area to use my scrap wood to build toys and such for the kids. Um, I was hoping you would be so kind as to provide project ideas I could use with simple tools. Now, I don't know whether he means to make them for the kids or let the kids wait, uh, make them. So um, that's the question. And it is funny that we all try to think of small projects when we're making things for children. Often this includes children's toys, kids' toys. And um, what we don't always realize is that children's toys can be quite problematic to make. And, um, and actually very often they are easier to make if you have a lathe, you can turn wheels you can turn chimney stacks, you can do all kinds of things with a lathe. So it's a combination maybe of hand tools, hand skills with lathe work. Um, small children's toys, they're not easy to come up with with hand tools. Children, they must be law compliant as much as you can. Now you may not um, be exposed to the law, but law is law. And usually the laws are created not to trip us up, not to make life hard for us, but because especially where children are concerned, the government, the governing authorities, the schools and so on, they want to make sure that the children, because they're vulnerable, are protected. And that's what we have to do. We have to take that responsibility on. So if we're making a crib for a baby, we want to make sure, look what the laws are and look what we can do even extra to make sure that the crib is safe. And it's the same with toys. Self-assembly toys work well with children and so if you are going to have little classes by your bench that's a great way to get children involved and that always pulls something out of me because I want kids involved. I don't want um, kids just to be, watch something being made, I want them to be involved in the making of it. So you've got to look at things like choking and swallowing, allergic reactions, non-toxic finishes and all of these different things. I think that's why inevitably we end up knocking pre-cut parts together like birdhouses and there's nothing wrong with that. There are certain skill levels where the children uh, are only capable of doing a certain level of, uh, of assembly work. So, but we don't want to prepare our kids for assembly work. So, but here's a project. I've got a couple of things here. I, when I had my children growing up, we carved wooden spoons day in, day out. We made all kinds of shapes and sizes. This was a great project for scraps. It was a great project to work with children with spatulas i've made literally thousands of these through the years with my children with other people's children training children making products for sale for selling in places like downtown i know a, a lady in oxford who stands on the street corner carves wooden spoons and sells them uh, when she's out there people stop and buy a 10 pound spoon or a 15 pound spoon does a great job um, i've got a project here just to give you some idea I thought we'd just quickly knock something out just to give you an idea. I've taken a piece of cardstock here and I just want to make a template for my bolt here. So I find the middle, this is the same size as this. So I fold this along the center line here. Basic, basic skills. I want the four, this is going to be a little boat or something like that, probably a boat. Here we go. That's the fore end of the boat. Here's the back end of the boat. And I might have this side tapered like this. Oops. There's my template. So very quick, very easy. These are just ideas. Put this, center it on here. It doesn't have to be dead centered because there's no square edges here and here we've got the basic shape for a boat whether you want to do this tail end square or not is entirely up to you but you can knock this out now very quickly just with a one inch chisel these are the kinds of things children like to do I did this with my own children and work those uh, areas down like this and then go on with your spoke shave shave it nice and easy and children love this so we've got our basic shape here 
this one we come down this long reach here children love this kind of work they love it so do adults me included okay this one too so think outside the box because this way you're making it don't take the band sawn parts it's very boring very dull kids can do this and you can do it too you could do this in front of an audience just pick your wood pine works great like that shape it again with the spoke shave take off those edges and it's great for learning which direction the grain goes in that kind of thing and then what I would do is I would chamfer the sides like this and like this and that's very quick and very simple so set one side of your spoke shave hard and just bevel that edge and from there you just go to your a piece of dowel make a couple of rods and um, add a sail a folded corner of something handkerchief size make a sail stitch it and that'll just give you an idea of, and then you can make a top stack a top stack you could put a sail on here all kinds of things so spoons spatulas cutting boards boats bird houses bat houses bee houses anything like that is good with children so there are lots and lots of projects you could choose but keep it simple great that's that one phew you wore me out okay that was for kc and uh, this next one i was just wondering if it was possible this is from Sean. To sharpen the blades of electrical tools using your sharpening techniques, planar routers, circular saws, that kind of thing. He says he's learned how to sharpen chisels and plane using this technique. It's the best and the simplest way he's ever seen. He was wondering if it was possible to use these electrical tools instead of buying new blades every time they get dull. The answer basically is no. Um, most of the um, blades used on high speed or on um, high speed machines like routers are made from uh, carbide so this carbide tipped uh, aspect to every blade whether it's planar knives or other knives um, is very hard very very hard it's not as hard as diamond but you will wear your diamond plates down in a heartbeat if you do start sharpening those um, blades that way and they also the profile cutters on routers are better done by a, a, a machine there's just some things that are better done by machine and sharpening carbide high-speed steels and so on is better done with a mechanical ground an electric grinder of some type um, so uh, that's my view on it really I know some people probably will agree somewhere but I think this is this is my answer I don't think it's practical they're de designed for high-speed work. They need high-speed sharpening, and therefore they're do they're a completely different category than hand tools. That's my view. So, I bought a load of wood around eight nine years ago. Cherry being most of one of the species, it was the ugliest cherry I've ever seen. So I never used it. Anyway, I kept the best boards and used the rest for firewood. I began milling it up uh, by hand yesterday, looking like you have taught us in the videos and it's working great after flattening one face of the boards I made my face mark blah 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 we clearly see the rising grain oh his, his question is basically about rising grain and this is where when you look at a piece of wood say like oak or figured material any kind of material here for instance there's a strong grey line in this board here and, and this grey line, uh, you might think that that's actually the grain. What it is, is part of the grain. It's a mineral deposit in the grain. But the grain is actually more accented by the split here. So it's actually going down here. But this makes it look like it's going up here. This happens all the time with wood, especially with woods like oak, where the medullary rays, the 
um, the ray flex in the wood are actually rising one way but the grain is going in a completely different direction and it can make it problematic for choosing grain direction. Here's another example where you have very highly figured material like this and you think oh this doesn't have any grain because it's so figured. Well it does, it will have a, a grain direction. Sometimes you can plane this board one way and it will tear out all to pieces and then you go the other way and it's as crystal clear that you're going in the right direction and so all woods have their own idiosyncrasies and you learn to work with the material and ultimately you'll find that as soon as like if I put this in the vise and, and I, this isn't a good piece of wood for this but I'm going to do it anyway if I put my plane on here and I plane this way I can feel already that I'm planing with the grain I'm getting a good finish if I turn this around let's see if I'm going against the grain, I've got a little bit of undulating grain here. So this grain is going in both directions and it's favourable for me either way I go. I can see some tear out here. So that one, it does work either way. So, But if I looked at the edge, the grain is actually rising up this way. Let me see if I can show you that. Again, it's showing me one thing on the surface, but what's inside? This will give you a good example here. I think. So we need a close up in here. And I think we can see. Do you see this line here? As I follow that line comes up to this pinnacle point here. That should mean that if I plane in this direction, this grain would tear. Uh, or if I plane in this direction, the grain would tear from this side. Let's give it a whirl. And this is what he's talking about, but it does, it is a, an issue. It's a bit difficult because this has a, a fractured edge on there. I'm gonna come back here just to see if I can take a shaving, just to see. Uh -oh, there we have it really Whew. that one nearly knocked me over so yeah this is tearing because I'm going against the grain here so if I turned it around and went this way I should get a much clearer shaving from this direction which I am I've got a clear a clear cut here a little too much set on there but that's fine and that's what the difference is so planing with the grain against the grain look on the side you can see it but sometimes you plane in the direction you think you should go and it's completely wrong just part and parcel of woodworking I'm afraid okay so that a lot of wood second part of the question is roughly marking out my pieces for my face frame and my doors then cross cut line. I, I think I know what he's talking about here. This is a place where he has to get three pieces out of this piece of wood and he feels like it's easier to surface plane and surface plane. What the issue becomes is if this was cupped this way and let's say we had a, a hollow on this side of one eighth of an inch then that means that this side would be bellied by an eighth of an inch. So when you combine those together you plane this side flat then you plane this side flat your material is quarter of an inch less than when you started so but he needs narrow pieces but so what I would say is if he wanted three narrow pieces here it's much better to cut this down and rip this down and that would reduce any cup in there to almost zero um, or certainly not uh, such a negligible amount it wouldn't matter so this is where with hand tool enthusiasts with us um, we would normally cut these to rough length, rough width, then start our surface planing and we would minimise the amount of wastage we have in our wood. So definitely uh, that's my preference and you know if you use a bandsaw that goes very quickly. I'm not, you know, I certainly like using the bandsaw for things like that. A bandsaw works perfectly for that. Okay. Uh, all right, I think I've answered that. Question from Forrest 
from my blog. Paul, can clear shellac be used as the top coat for a white pickled finish to preserve the whiteness? I have found that even water-based poly finishes tend to leave a yellow cast to the wood. The project is a bed made from ash. Okay, he's got a pickle stain, um, but I'm not really sure. He says it's a white pickle stain. That usually means that what they want is they want the, uh, the, the openness of the grain to absorb the white and then leave the rest the ash colour or whatever. So that, that's what he's looking for, I think. And then he's going to apply a top coat. Yes, blonde uh, bleached clear shellac will work fine for that. And it will not, I don't think it'll yellow too much for you. I think it'll be acceptable. Um, it's an easy finish to apply. Um, I think it's a good finish to put on a bed and especially on a bed because basically you, the arms and so on don't touch the sides of the bed or the headboard or whatever and so you know it doesn't break down uh, like lacquers do. Lacquers are very problematic for places where your arms go on the edge of the table. The oils from the skin will break the lacquer down you have to resurface it, resurface it after five or six years usually. Um, I think that will answer that. Okay, question. Nicholas, good evening, fine sir. That must be me, I think. All right, with your videos and as aspiration, I've been starting the projects. Oh no, I've just answered that one. Oh no, no, this is not the one. Okay, I've got it now. He started doing projects with his kids this week, tackling sanding, sealing, and staining the stairs. I apparently dripped sweat while I was applying the stain and have a bunch of dark spots. Do you, do you know how to correct it? I suspect I need to sand the spots and restrain and restain. Thank you for any suggestions. My suggestion to him was he obviously isn't training his children right because they should be doing the sanding. Oh no, I didn't say that. Um, okay. The, the, the reality is that he should test the stain now uh, by going over it, sanding an inconspicuous area and recoating it with the stain and seeing how it looks after he's done that. That's the only way I can think of to do that. And so he sands out his sweat, sands out the darkness and then recoats it and that will be fine. I can't answer it any differently because I don't know what kind of stain he uses. Is it oil based? Is it aniline dye? Is it, you know, uh, something that he's concocted together I don't know so I think that will answer the question for you Nick Nicholas and um, what's this one this one snuck up on me this one question from Mike hi Paul I'm hoping to rekindle my love of woodworking that I used to share with my grandchildren oh with my with my granddad and I bought a couple of books to help out I was hoping you may have some recommendations on other books that may help out Pro preferably more about the use of hand tools. Well, I know a book. You think I s put this in here, don't you? There is a wonderful book called Essential Woodworking Hand Tools written by a guy called Paul Sellers. He's an Englishman and he's been working with hand tools all his life and he's been doing it for 50 years and he wrote down everything he knew in the book. So that's my suggestion is buy that book. That will give you the essential tools and this was not planned this was just stuck right here in this lot so he wants to cut out power tools this is the way to go mike plug in join us going woodworking masterclasses look at my blog you've got years of reading to get through but you can do it <laughs>